Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on creating neuroinclusive schools. We have got um, an amazing 200 people signed up uh, for this webinar, which is um, incredible. So thank you so much for signing up and for giving us your time today. I hope you're going to leave with lots of really positive things that you can do to help make uh, schools in your community more accessible um, for neurodivergent people and for neuroinclusive so that they feel that the school was designed for them, which is what I feel needs to be the ultimate aim of education, but I'll get more into that in a moment. Um, just to make an introduction to somebody who's uh, one of the participants today, who's also my assistant, um, Pranel Pillay, and she is going to be popping some links into the chat for us as we go through some useful resources that you might find. Um, uh, for example, our handout, um, which is packed full of useful information, and also um, the link to Menti, because we're using an interactive session today. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to get us started. Pranel, if you wouldn't mind popping in the chat um, the information about uh, Menti and the handout, please. That would be really helpful. Super. Okay. Right. Um, I'm hoping Pranel is going to be <laughs> popping it in there in a second. Oh, here we go. There it is. She was just finding it. Um, so there's the handout, everyone. And we're going to be going on to Menti in just a second. Oh, goodness. Super. So I'm going to share my screen and we can get started. Oh, there we go. Super. Wonderful. So we're going to be talking about creating neuro-inclusive schools. And by a neuro-inclusive school, I mean a school where all people who think in all different ways feel that they the school has been designed for them and that they're welcome there and that they're not different. So we're going to be interactive today. So uh, there's a link in the chat. For now, we'll keep popping it in there for the new people who join. So we've got loads of people signed up today. So please do um, click on that link in the chat and then it will just take you to a blue screen that says get interactive. If the link's not working for you, you can also use on your mobile phone, you can scan this QR code, which will take you there. And then once you're on the page, just like the page in the bottom right hand corner that just shows me that people are being able to access um, the page and that it's all the text working for us, which <laughs> um, can be hit and miss sometimes. Um, but yeah, please like the page when you've managed to get access. Again, the link will be in the chat for now. I'll keep posting it there as new people join. So if you see it a few times, that's why, because sadly people can't access the chat from before they were uh, they joined us. So I can see there's 20 people. We've got way more than that online. So please do get interactive in this session um, because you will learn a lot more um, as you help co-create some of the slides um, and learn from other participants as well. So please do get involved by um, following the link uh, or using the QR code and then just like the page by hitting the bottom right hand corner there and um, to show us that you've managed to make it fabulous. So just a little bit about my aims for this talk so you can know where I'm taking this. Um, I'm going to be first of all talking about the SEND crisis in the UK um, that we're currently very aware of I'm sure and then we're going to be talking about executive functions, neurodiversity and trauma. Um, why connection, relationships and belonging are fundamental to personal development. And then finally, why a compassionate whole school approach um, can help every young person flourish. So let's check Menti is working and let's have an introduction to who we've got in our audience today. So which of these best describes you, please? Okay. Good, we've got a great breadth of people in the room. Lots of parents, it's wonderful to see. Um, but across the board, a number of senior leaders, classroom teachers, SENCOs, learning support specialists, um, and then a number of others. Um, please do pop what kind of other you are into the chat. I'd love to see that. Um, be really useful for us to know. Um, but thank you. Really interesting to see a big turnout from parents here in the cohort. And for those of you that have just joined us, we've got way more than the people who've actually voted on this slide. So please do join Menti uh, using the link in the chat. 
um, and that will take you to Menti so that you can contribute to some of these interactive slides because your voices are important to us. So we'd love to hear them. Fabulous. Great. Thank you so much um, for sharing that information. I'm going to get started with the talk now with a little bit of an introduction about myself. So my name is Victoria Bagnall um, and I am neurodivergent. I have a diagnosis of dyslexia and I'm neurodivergent. That means that I think differently from the norm, the neurotypical um, people. Um, and despite my dyslexia, I did manage to get to the University of Cambridge to read geography. So my dyslexia doesn't mean that I am lesser, just that I think differently. Um, I have a PGC in secondary geography, so I am a teacher, um, so I really know what it's like in the classroom. Um, I'm also a mother of three gorgeous girls. I've got a 12-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a four-year-old about to turn five. I'm also the co-founder of Connections in Mind and an organization called The Code as well. And I'm going to talk briefly about my light bulb moment. I normally talk quite in depth about this when we do our free intro, but I really want to get on to the important work of talking about schools. Um, but I, because of my neurodivergent thinking and the way that I show up in society, I um, received a lot of kind of negative input throughout my life about um, my executive function talent, a bit where I'll come on to what they are in a minute. Um, I thought that I was lazy and disorganized and really just not a good enough human being. And I kept getting that kind of feedback from uh, my parents, from school, from my friends. Um, and it wasn't until I was working alongside a young lady who got the highest ever score in the thinking skills assessment for Oxford. So she was off the scale bright, but she just couldn't do the mechanics of the learning. She couldn't get an essay in on time. She struggled with her homework. She struggled with revision. Her desk was really untidy. Her, her bag, her school bag was kind of a black hole of pieces of paper and, and things that were important and never kind of made their way out of there again. Um, and I was working on this particular case with this young lady alongside a psychiatrist, and I was doing some SEN tutoring at the time. Um, and I said to the psychiatrist, how is it this young lady can be so intelligent but find these basic things so difficult? And she said, Victoria, you've got to read this book. I did. I read this book and I found that I had a bit of a light bulb moment. I was like, oh my goodness, this is this young lady. But also this had been me as I was growing up as well. So this book, Smart But Scattered Teens, really kind of sums it up. And um, it's smart, so intelligent, but just all over the place. And I'm sure we can all relate to young people who are a bit like that. And this is the author Peg Dawson here. And in my very neurodivergent way, very impulsive, I jumped on the first plane after reading the book over to the US. Um, and went to one of Peg Dawson's trainings in Boston and then took her out for lunch. And I said, Peg, <laughs> you've got to come to England. And in her wonderful, generous way, she agreed to come to the UK, to London. And we hosted, posted the first ever training of executive function specialists in the UK back in 2015. Um, and since that point, um, I then met my co-founders, Imogen Moore Shelley, who sadly passed away last year, and Dr. Bettina Honan, who's a clinical psychologist and also a lecturer at UCL. And we had a, a shared belief, and our belief is that knowledge of our brains and our brain states can help us to be kinder to ourselves and those around us. And we really on a mission to change the way that people think about different ways of thinking and to help everyone to be kinder to themselves and to those around them. So I want to talk about the SEND crisis now. I'm sure you're all hyper aware of this, but for those that aren't, I think it's always worth going over it again. So we know that the number of pupils that are diagnosed um, or on the SCN register is increasing. It's almost 20% now. You can see that in the figures here. And also at the same time, we've got all these rises in numbers of children with special educational needs, but the local authorities don't have the funding to meet those needs. Um, and uh, local authorities are currently at deficits of about 2.4 billion in total um, based on um, information from their treasurers. So it's a really kind of dire crisis in funding. But also on top of that, we have a profession of teachers who say that their workload is totally unmanageable. They're feeling totally swamped. Um, and really, you know, it's just putting a lot of pressure on them to show up um, and support young people. So it's a real crisis that we have um, at the moment. 
and something that we have a we believe we have a solution for um, in creating neuro inclusive schools where every single child feels like the school was designed for them and that not that they're different and need specialist extra support and that is the key message um, that we want to pass along today and I'm going to talk to you about how we do that um, as part of these slides. So, so I've been talking about something called executive functioning, um, and I'm not sure how familiar you are all are with these terms. So some of you will be regulars at our webinars, which is wonderful, um, and others will be newbies. So I can see we've already got one expert in the room, so that's fabulous. Um, but I'm sure we have people across the spectrum of knowledge as well. Look, we've got some people who've never heard of them before. Um, so really interesting to see it. Now, I'm a geographer, so graphs get me very excited. Um, I know, very sad. Um, so you can see a really interesting distribution here. We've got a few people saying they've never heard of executive functions. Um, the majority of people saying they're kind of around the middle. Um, and then a few people saying they consider themselves to be a bit of an expert about executive functions, which is wonderful to see because this curve is very different back in 2015, when most people were like, executive what? <laughs> and they'd never heard of it. So I think that's testament to the work that we've been doing to raise awareness on this. And um, just a note to those of you that aren't yet on Mentee, um, please do join in on the interactive element. It really does help deepen your learning. Um, and I can see that we've got kind of less than half of the people that are actually on the webinar um, actually contributing. So please do get involved. It will help you, I promise. So there's a link in the chat. Um, please follow that link for now if you wouldn't mind popping it back up there again um, so that people can find it. That would be great. Super. So what are executive functions? So executive functions are the cognitive processes, which means brain processes, which reside in the prefrontal cortex of our brain. So that's a bit of our brain behind our forehead. And a lot of people ask me, why on earth are they called executive functions? Isn't that a dreadful term? But actually, when you think about where the word is derived, it does make a lot of sense. So that part of the brain is responsible for helping us execute tasks and to get things done. Um, and um, I can see a Pranav, someone has just raised their hand, Jay Christie. Pranav, would you mind just messaging them and see if you can help out? And um, Christy, uh, Jay Christie, would you mind just putting something in the chat and then Pranav can help you out? She's assisting me today. Thank you so much. Um, and so they're also, so they're involved in the timely execution of tasks and emotional regulation as well. But how do we know about them? So a lot of people, when I talk about executive functions, and believe me, if you're sitting next to you on the bus, on a train, or a dinner party, or at the theatre, you will get your ear bent about executive functions because I am so passionate about it. But lots of people ask me in conversation, and they say, well, if they're so important, why don't we all know about them? And that's because of one key thing, and that's because neuroscientists are very good at science, but they're not very good at PR. They're not very good at communicating what they've learned about the brain to the rest of us. And there's a really good new book that's just come out called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, which I really recommend um, reading. It's been made very accessible um, and it's by someone called Lisa Feldman Barrett. So do have a look at that Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Great recommendation. Um, so what we now know about the brain um, is based on the science that has developed around fMRI scanners, our ability to look at a human brain when someone is alive and, and conscious and see how their brain lights up or what how it's active when they're doing certain tasks. And we know that prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain, is responsible for getting things done. For executive functioning um, and these are things that we used to think of as character flaws that if we had these challenges that were somehow deficient um, or lesser or flawed um, but we now know that's not the case it's just a difference in the architecture of our brains and i'm going to talk more about that in a moment so who is affected Every single person on this planet, as I will go on to prove in a minute, um, does have executive function challenges. And we do um, regular insets with teachers where we've got hundreds and hundreds of teachers in the room and everyone has their own unique profile. Nobody has a perfect executive function profile. It's really important to remember. So what am I talking about? What does this mean for our lives? Well, executive functions are responsible for things like meeting deadlines, prioritizing which work to complete first, regulating our emotions, 
inhibiting our responses, that's stopping ourselves from doing things we might instinctually want to do, organizing our belongings, so keeping things tidy, organizing our thoughts on paper, essay writing, report writing, etc. Holding information in our heads, that's our working memory. Keeping time, now this is a really interesting one, as a geographer, I'm fascinated by different cultures and their relationships with time, especially in punctuality. In the West, we value punctuality very highly as a character trait um, and as a character flaw. If we don't have um, punctuality, but in other cultures, that's not, not the case at all. Um, so very important to see that as a cultural construct that we have. Um, and finally, we've got thinking flexibility, our ability to think on our feet and to take in new information and change the way that we um, approach something. So over to you. I'm going to ask you to self-reflect now, not your children in your care, but actually yourself. Which of these do you struggle with? And you can choose as many as you like. For those of you that have just joined, um, you can access the Menti by clicking on the link in the chat um, or going to menti.com and typing in the code. Um, in fact, um, the code is not showing on here. So <laughs> just, cu cu uh, just click on the link. We need to get that out. Okay, I love it when we've got a nice big audience on this because it's very interesting to me to see how the distribution goes um, in a large population. So we've still got quite a few people to fill it out. We've got almost 100 people online right now um, and only 41 people have filled it out. So please do get involved. I promise you it will deepen your learning if you do get involved in these interactive slides. Okay, so what we can see here is that holding information in our heads, um, that's our working memory, is something that many of us struggle with, over 50%. Regulating our emotions, again, over 50% and prioritizing work to be completed, followed by organizing our thoughts on paper um, and then keeping time. But what's really important about this slide is to help us to realize that these challenges affect us all. This isn't just something for the SEN department, for children who think differently. This is something for every single child, every single teacher, every single member of staff, the catering team, the cleaning team, the grounds team, whoever, the parents, whoever is involved in a school community can benefit from learning about executive functioning because that can help them to be kinder to themselves and those around them. So thank you so much for contributing to that slide. So my next slide is gonna ask you, last time you struggled with your the executive functions, the thing that you struggled with on the previous slide, last time you struggled, which emotions did you feel? And I think you can put up to three in here. Oh, that's a big first one. <laughs> Thank you for that. And so this is going to create a word cloud. So the more we see the same emotions come up, the larger that word will become. So if any of these resonate with you, that's how you feel. Yep. Then write that in there and then that will bring us up as a bigger, bigger one there. Okay, so those of you who have completed this, just look at this word cloud as it forms on our screens and just look at the types of emotions that we're feeling about what I have just told you is a natural and normal part of being a human being. Okay. So I always get quite emotional when I see this because it's like, oh my goodness. These are really, really challenging emotions. I actually call them painful emotions because they light up the same part of our brain that physical pain does, okay? So they're very painful emotions. So we've got frustration, we've got overwhelm, we've got anger, we've got sad, we've got stupid, we've got useless, we've got shame, embarrassment, worthless, panic, um, annoyed, hopeless, um, defeated, stressed disappointment, anxiety. These are really challenging emotions, I think you'll all agree. And I think that runs very deep um, in our psyches. So my next question to you is, what is the root of these painful emotions? Where do they come from? We're not born feeling these painful emotions when our executive functions let us down. When we're babies, we cry when we need something. We don't show any inhibitory control. But at some point we learn that it is frustrating when we can't control our inhibitions, um, that it's shameful 
where do we, yeah, so there's a lot of shame behind this. We're comparing ourselves to others. Yeah, school policies have a lot to do with it, external judgment. But what is the kind of big overarching kind of power, as it were, um, that this comes from? So we've got high expectations from others, expectations from others, competition school scores not feeling good enough, other people's societal expectations. Thank you to whoever wrote that. It comes from society. So a lot of people say it's parents, a lot of people say it's schools, but I don't believe in um, that the individual is the, the sole person here. Actually, it's society, because as a collective, we have these very strong opinions about how... Um, these executive function challenges are character flaws and we need to punish them in order to prevent people from um, showing these character flaws and we need to that's the way that we need to solve this problem and that's very embedded in our culture it's a, like an unconscious bias that we have against executive function challenges and it's embedded in our society and in our culture it is not down to the individual so i don't like to i don't I'm not in the in the process of blaming schools or blaming parents or anyone else because i don't think it's down to the individual i think this is a collective responsibility that we have to unpick this unconscious bias and to move away from it to a more compassionate future for people who think differently. So thank you so much for your contribution there. So here are just some examples of unconscious bias about um, executive function challenges in school. So these came from some of the delegates from our um, executive function skills support professional training. And we were looking at unconscious bias in schools. And these were some of the things that we saw. Um, so you can see here, that there's various different consequences. So we're looking at the left one, left hand side one first. The, the kind of goal is brilliant behavior, which is perfect executive functioning. And then there's all these different consequences one gets um, for not exhibiting this perfect executive functioning. But we've just proven that everyone struggles with these things and it is impossible for us to be perfect. But yet we hold children to these very, very high standards. And I don't think we shouldn't have high standards for young people. I do think we should help them to develop these skills around executive functioning but I don't think shaming and punishing them is the way to do that and I'll talk about why in a minute then we've got here this one is very beautifully presented isn't it so we've got all these young people who are staying on track so they're going around whizzing around on the um uh on the course here but those people who are in stop they're having timeouts and they've got five 10 15 minutes poor adam's got 15 minutes and he's got a really sad face because he's really struggling with his executive functions it's not called executive functions it's called behavior but that's what's happening here so you can see how these things very creatively done and meant with the best possible intentions but actually um, is causing a lot of shame for poor adam he was the one he's being made to feel that he's deficient because he has these challenges. And then finally, we've got here the habits for learning, uh, learning habits for success. Um, so you can see uh, down the bottom in concern, I regularly miss my homework deadlines. So that's time management, planning, prioritization. I don't complete my, um, my home or classwork to an acceptable standard. That could be to do with sustained attention, um, with task initiation. I often forget my book. That's to do with working memory. I don't have the right equipment. That's organization. And I don't concentrate well in lessons. Well, that's sustained attention. So you can see how they're just so embedded in behavior policies. Um, in schools, um, and this unconscious bias runs very, very deep. So we've got to spend a little time going a bit deep there. So let's get back to some neuroscience for some light relief. Um, so I want to talk to you about executive functions now and executive function skills and what's the difference between the two. So firstly, we've got the executive functions. This is the brain functions, what the brain is actually doing. So we know in the prefrontal cortex that the brain is responsible, that part of the brain is responsible for cognitive flexibility, our ability to shift and change our thinking depending on new information that comes to light. Yeah. Inhibitory control, that's the ability to stop ourselves from doing things that we might instinctually want to do. And finally, our working memory, our ability to hold information in our heads whilst doing complex tasks. 
And at Connections in Mind, we talk about 11 um, executive function skills because we can't use an MRI scanner to scan children's brains. In fact, that probably wouldn't be ethical. Um, in fact, what we can do is see skills that they have and we can measure those skills just like we measure their attainment at maths or uh, science or tennis or, or whatever it is that they're learning and developing. So these are the skills that sit alongside and that we need that prefrontal cortex for to have these skills. So it's working memory, inhibitory control and cognitive flexibility. So those are the brain processes map onto skills. But there's also other skills as well. So goal directed persistence, resilience or grit, that's a skill that can be developed. And in order to be goal directed, we need to remember what we're working on. So our working memory, we need our inhibitory control, not just to get distracted and go off and do something else. And we need our cognitive flexibility for when the inevitable obstacle arises to think uh, laterally and come up with a different plan to overcome that obstacle. I'm not going to go through all of these because um, that would take us all the rest of the session, <laughs> but um, just another one just to pick out on. So metacognition, okay, to be self-aware, to be aware of ourselves and our impact on others and our environment, we need the working memory to remember what we did and other people's reactions and then the cognitive flexibility to see things from different perspectives. So we need those brain functions in order to do these things. And executive function skills are needed in every aspect of learning. Okay, so we need them to not call out in class. We need them to self-reflect and self-evaluate. We need them to write essays, to do homework, to do revision and to do exams. They're just so embedded in all of those things. But also we need them for the subjects themselves. So in order to be good at maths, one needs a very strong working memory. Um, so working memory is so, so important, but you also need your cognitive flexibility because you need to manipulate the information you're given and put it into a different format. And that requires cognitive flexibility in order to be good at literacy or any kind of written tasks. Um, you need to be able to use your working memory to remember what you want to say. And then you need to use your cognitive flexibility to put that into the written word, which is different from how you might verbalize it. Um, and so that's why often young people with executive function challenges can be very able verbally but really struggle to write things down and other things that we might see um uh, around executive functioning all these kind of things at the top of the iceberg but i want to start at the bottom of the iceberg now and talk to you about why we have executive function challenges so there's um a lot of research happening on this and as in with everything when science there's a discourse that goes on but there's generally it's agreed that there's both a genetic predisposition to have executive function challenges that things like adhd and um and other neurodivergent traits run in families it's her as heritable it's quite actually ADHD, um, but also um, there's also a psychological trauma element as well. And that's research coming out of the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, um, showing differences in brain architecture where the prefrontal cortex is smaller and a part of the brain called the amygdala is enlarged in young people who have experienced psychological trauma. So none of these things are the choice of the child. It's either their genes or some awful thing that has happened to them in their formative years. So they're not making a choice to exhibit these kind of behaviors, although that's the language that's all, all often given. But what we've got is these executive function challenges. And then we saw from our work cloud, didn't we, these kind of really painful emotions, this shame, guilt, frustration, feeling fearful, hopeless, and isolated and unlovable. And then what we see on the surface is these behaviors that we try to control. We see that people that swear, break the rules and have emotional outbursts, or maybe they just struggle to get it down on paper. They don't complete their homework. Maybe they're destructive in class and they shout out. Maybe they just forget things easily and they're always a bit scatterbrained. But some children are really quiet and compliant at school, but explosive at home. And those are the ones that have learned to um, use all of their energy to comply with the rules in school because they know what they need to do and all children know what they need to do. It's whether they have the ability to do that or not. So some children just use all of their energy to comply when it's really challenging for them. And so when they get home, they're exhausted and the wheels come off and they let it all out with their parents who they feel safe with. So a little bit of um, information about executive functions and neurodivergent traits. Um, so this is Russell Barkley. He is the, like the godfather of um, ADHD and he has dedicated his life to researching this area. And he talks about ADHD as both self-regulation deficit disorder and also executive function deficit disorder. So they're interchangeable terms. There's also some very 
recent research um, from April last year um, in um, talking about specific learning disabilities, which is what we now call dyslexia and dyspraxia. Um, so um, specific learning disabilities, you can see all the different executive functions that they have attributed um, to these. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but you can see that if you have dyslexia or dyspraxia, or what we now call specific learning disabilities with impairment in, um, then you can see how the executive functions are impacted. Um, also, there's lots of evidence to show the link between um, autism spectrum disorder or condition and executive functioning. I don't like the use of disorder or condition. I just think it's just autistic or not. Um, but it's interesting that it was referred to like that in the literature. So I like to think, and this is oversimplifying things, but it does help us to make sense of it. Um, I like to think of these three different areas of brain functioning as mapping on to the traits that we might see and that we might um, use for diagnosis. So with cognitive flexibility, that's our ability to sh shift and change our thinking. If we struggle with that, we, we struggle when plans change or to see things from different people's perspectives, that tends to be autistic traits. If we struggle with our inhibitory control, if we're really impulsive, that tends to be our ADHD traits. And finally, if we struggle to read and write, that's often around our working memory that's getting in the way there. And there's a lot of research to show that. So let's get on to some more brain science now and thinking about regulated and dysregulated brain states, which is the two brain states that we talk about connections in mind, which is really important because we need a regulated brain state in, or, in order to learn. Our brain is programmed to send, um, to prioritize survival over learning. Um, makes sense, doesn't it? We've got to stay alive before we can learn and do things differently. Um, and so the brain is constantly balancing what we call the body budget and making sure that the energy is going in the right place. So we have the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that does the executive functioning. And we call that our air traffic control center of the brain. It's kind of controlling all of the neurons that are firing and making sure things are getting done. And that's where we think before we act. That's that kind of rational brain um, that we kind of want to see in young people at school. But then we have the amygdala. The amygdala is like our threat detector. It's always kind of sensing if we're under threat and looking for patterns of where we've been harmed in the past um, and making sure that it's keeping us safe. And so when the amygdala um, is sending messages to the brain that there's a threat, then everything is put um, to protecting and safeguarding that, that person, that brain, um, rather than thinking rationally and getting things done. That's when we act before we think, we run away, we freeze, um, et cetera. And there's this really handy hand model of the brain that I want to show you, which helps us to talk about this with young people and also adults. I use this with bankers in the city of London. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just putting your hand up for me like this and folding your thumb across your fingers, then we've got this knobbly bit of your thumb that sticks out. That's the amygdala, that's the threat detector. And then we have our prefrontal cortex here, which most of the time is keeping the amygdala in check. But when the amygdala senses any kind of threat, it dysregulates the brain and says, oi, prefrontal cortex, off you go. It flips off and there's less of a connection between the two. The amygdala kind of takes charge and makes sure that the, the person is safe. OK, and what we want to do in our work in schools is make sure that young people are always feeling psychologically safe so that they can engage their whole brain. That's really important. And I'm talking a bit more about how we can do that as we go through, but obviously that takes time to develop. So there are longer training courses that we can offer to support that. It's also really important to remember that when a child is in that flipped lid state, they are not making choices about their behavior. They are showing us that they are distressed. And it's really important to see that that's not bad behavior. They're not deficient. They're not naughty. They are distressed. And I think it's really important that we change our language around that and that we help people to understand that when we see dysregulated behavior, so we see um, people breaking school rules, it's because of distress, not because they're making choices to behave in that way. 
So this is talking about trauma and executive functioning. So as I mentioned, Harvard Center, Harvard Center on the Developing Child has conducted a lot of research along with a lot of other universities in the US. Um, and they have found that um, children who've experienced excessive stress as they grow up, so this is trauma, um, that impacts the development of their brain. So they've been able to see on brain scans that the prefrontal cortex is smaller and the amygdala is enlarged. And if you think about it in terms of our hand model of the brain, if you're using your amygdala as being used all the time because you're feeling dysregulated that's going to grow bigger and your prefrontal cortex is going to be smaller there's also something called the frontal amygdala connection as well which can be measured and that is weaker as well um, and that also affects us in adulthood too if we experience something that's really shocking like a, a death or an event like covid that can create this sense of brain fog in our brain which is where it's difficult to get things done and that's because the trauma um, has bypassed our prefrontal cortex, got us to kind of keeping ourselves safe and protecting us from the shock. And it's difficult to get things done. So if you have a friend who's experienced um, a death in the family um, or a big shocking event, the best thing that you can do to go and help them is to go and put a wash on or help them hang out the laundry or cook a meal or something very practical like that because they often struggle to get those things done. And in the research and all of the work that we do at Connections in Mind is backed by reams and reams of research. Um, there's been a lot of evidence about how we can make sure that executive functioning is working as best as it can. Um, so the first one, the first block is um, safety. Psychological and physical safety are really important. Then we've got exercise, um, so cardio, um, but just also any kind of exercise where we get our bodies moving. Connection, so this feeling a sense of belonging and love and having strong relationships. Um, fun, so that's play and um, enjoying ourselves. And then joy, that feeling of happiness and feeling success. And then we've got calm, so that's moments, that's yoga, mindfulness, that kind of thing. And then we've got sleep. Sleep is, um, of course, essential for brain development, as we know. And then food, it's very much about a slow release energy, not kind of sugar spikes, um, because we've all kind of experienced hangry, haven't we, when we're running low on glucose in the brain and the brain is just looking for glucose because it needs a lot of glucose to work. Um, and so it's looking for food. And so it will do anything to get that food and it gets quite angry. You get quite angry when we're there. So that's that hangry state um, that we can all relate to. So I'm... Uh, from the research and from all the work that we've done, we have realized that connection and belonging is so fundamental to personal development, but yet something that really isn't prioritized in our schools today, which I think is such a shame. And the reason of this, because um, we have, there's a concept called neuroception, whereas our entire nervous system, which is our brain and also all of our nerves throughout our body, um, is constantly evaluating the environment for cues of safety, for patterns of where they have been unsafe in the past that they need to prepare for being under threat. Okay, so the body is constantly looking out for this. And then when, the, when we feel psychologically safe, when we feel like we're with people who understand us, that we feel that sense of belonging and that the environment was created for us, with us in mind, then we can really relax. Um, and that's that place of psychological safety that we can get to. So it's really important that we create these places of psychological safety. And I'm going to be taking us on to why that's important now. I want to talk about traditional behavior policies first and, and how they can really derail young people who have executive function challenges. Because what happens is, is in this pink um, arrow here, we tend to have the child with executive function challenges dis displays unexpected behavior in the school environment. And the normal go-to is some form of punishment or um, being noted down as a concern or something that makes them feel different and makes them feel ashamed of having these challenges. They then feel unwanted, alone, misunderstood, frustrated, as we saw in our word cloud. And that makes them dysregulated. They flip their lid and then they exhibit more unexpected behavior. And so this spiral continues and to this stage when often they're asked to leave school because the school just cannot cope with their behavior anymore. But actually, if they've jumped in when the unexpected behavior had first come up and sat down with a young person and shown them compassion and care rather than punishment, 
we can stop this vicious spiral in its tracks and we can help these young people to develop the skills they need to be successful. Um, it's such an important part of the process. So here are some case studies of what I'm talking about here. So this is Susie. So Susie has um, a diagnosis of ADS, ASD, sorry. So that's autism spectrum disorder. And she has flexibility and metacognition challenges, which is very common. So the teacher implements the behavior policy and Susie feels it's unfair. So she's triggered. She flips her lid. She then mutters something like, that's really unfair. Nothing rude, but just in the tone that it's quite rude because she's dysregulated. The teacher then becomes dysregulated because they've heard her being uh, insubordinate. And the teacher questions Susie's behavior. What did you say? To Susie becomes very dysregulated at that point. She loses control of her behavior and she throws something across the room, swears at the teacher or does something that contravenes the behavior policy. The teacher escalates according to behavior policy and Susie ends up in detention in front of the head, whatever the policy says there. You can see how the teacher could step in at a certain point with empathy and support and help um, de-escalate the situation at that point. Here we've got George. George has ADHD and inhibitory control challenges, which means that he has a disability. That means that he has executive function challenges. Um, things like he struggles with things like um, not chewing gum in class and um, answering the, back to the teacher and uh, wearing the wrong shoes. And all these are minor misdemeanors that are seen as minor things by the school. Um, and they, they find it difficult to differentiate between his ADHD and these minor misdemeanors. And I don't think there is any difference. He has a disability that means that he can't do those things and he needs to be helped to develop skills to not do those things. Um, but the way the school deals with it is these he has these things called strikes, which are like negatives that accumulate and gets to a certain point where he gets to detention. So for all these little things that he's done wrong, um, he gets this detention. He has to write a reflective essay on why he must abide by the school rules. And of course, George doesn't care about this. He's just like so disengaged by the school at that point. He's not, it's not having the impact um, that is required. And so nobody is sitting down with George and helping him to develop the skills to not chew gum in class and to not answer the teacher back. And so these detentions accumulate and eventually he's threatened with suspension. And actually poor George, not his real name, has actually been asked to leave this school really sadly from very, very small misdemeanors that started out, but it escalated and escalated and escalated um, because he wasn't taught the skills to meet the expectations the school had of him. And then we've got Kit. Kit doesn't have a formal diagnosis. He has sustained attention, time management and task initiation challenges. And he is charming in class and has a very strong verbal ability, but he's chronically late. He's always disheveled and always has an excuse. He performs well in tests, but he could do better. And he's given the benefit of the doubt at primary school. But at secondary school, they're less lenient. So these strikes and detentions and negatives accumulate. And he has this crisis of confidence. Am I this charming, likable chap? Or am I this naughty boy that's always in trouble? And that really impacts his mental health. And finally, we've got Emily. So Emily doesn't have a formal diagnosis, but she has metacognition, flexibility, and working memory challenges. She often makes out of place comments, struggles to make friends. She sits alone at playtimes and the other girls tease her about her shoes. She seems engaged in school, but she's not reaching her potential and her parents struggle to get her into school. And we've all, we all know Emily's in our in communities. So I just want to think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs now, because that um, diagram that I showed you about the building blocks of executive functions really maps onto Maslow back in the 1940s. He had it right. So we've got the physiological needs, we've got safety, psychological um, safety and physical safety, love and belonging, and then esteem, and then we get to growth. If these needs aren't met, we can't get to these places. And it's really important to remember that we need to prioritize these things um, in order to help young people to flourish. So what do we mean by belonging? What did Maslow mean by belonging? And what do we mean by belonging in the research that um, is coming out about the neuroscience of strong executive functioning? Well, I really like this metaphor. So bear with me with this. Um, so equality is being invited to the party. Inclusion is about being asked to dance. But belonging is dancing like nobody's watching. It's that ability to feel totally psychologically safe in an environment and to be yourself, to show up as your whole self. And that is what we're looking for in belonging. But it's also really essential to remember that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. 
Belonging is not something that children do to fit into the school environment. Belonging is the something that schools do to adapt themselves to meet the need of every single learner in their community. And that's a really important distinction there. So let's have a look at our case studies. Um, so looking back to Susie and George and Kit um, and um, Emily at the end, how do you feel they're doing according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, <laughs> well, the first two in there, not so great. Um, Hmm. Very interesting to see these numbers coming in. Thank you for everyone for contributing. So I think we can all agree that they're not having their needs met by the school environment. Um, and I think that's really important to remember is that when young people are exhibiting these distressed behaviors, that that's because their needs aren't being met. And it's our responsibility as educators to make sure those needs are being met. And we need to be getting our detective hats on and working out what needs are not being met. And all too often, it's about psychological safety and feeling of love and belonging that we can focus on. And it's not easy to create those, but it is possible. And some incredible schools around the world are doing this work to absolutely phenomenal results. And also an amazing culture of the school. Who wouldn't want to be part of a school community where the feelings of love and belonging are paramount to the work that's being done there? Who wouldn't want that? I mean, surely that's got to be a good thing for everybody. I also just want to think about what happens when their needs aren't met. So what happens is we get this poor self-talk. And I had this when I was a kid. You know, you're not good enough. You're just lazy. You're disorganized. And you have this poor self-image, which then impacts your performance. And then when you have poor performance, then you think you're not good enough and so on and so forth. It spirals down and down and down. So these children can end up then in the depths of despair. They often have this kind of self-talk. I'm lazy. I'm not organized. I'm not punctual. I'm not whatever it is enough. What's wrong with me? I don't belong here. It's really important. But what we want to do is shift that self-talk. And we want help to help young people, especially neurodivergent young people, to think about things in a different way. I'm working on my skills. It's going to take me time to master, but I am enough. And my teachers understand me. That's what we want to change the self-talk to. And it will have phenomenal impacts on children's mental health. So going back to Dan Siegel's and model of the brain, when young people have that sense of belonging, then they will be able to use their whole brains and they will be able to show up, to learn better, to contribute better to the school and everyone will win. So it's a win-win situation really when we focus on a sense of community and belonging. So what does a neuro-inclusive school look like? So a neuro-inclusive school nurtures the whole brain of every child in four key ways. The first one is around developing relational approaches to behavior management. I prefer self-discipline. Okay, we teach the skills of self-discipline through an executive function approach. And if anyone wants to learn more about it, Laurie DeSaltes is fantastic on this. And this is her fluffy neuron she's got in her hands there. We also focus on belonging and not fitting in. And this is Professor Catherine Riley from UCL. And she talks about fitting in being something the individual has to do, but belonging is something an institution does. I just realized I've not spelled belonging correctly there. Well done to anyone else who noticed that. The next one is embedding an executive function skills approach. So Laurie Faith is a colleague of ours that we've worked alongside. She's a, a teacher turned researcher based in the University of Toronto. And her activated learning pedagogy is based on building executive function literacy and then um, a pedagogical approach called mental contrasting, which you can look up, um, but our training can help teachers to develop that pedagogy as well. And finally, we've got um, self-compassion and care. So it's really important that our teaching staff 
model the same that we're expecting of young people, that self-compassion, building up their building blocks and looking after themselves in order that children feel that it's okay to prioritize their self-care in order to be the best that they can be. And we do this through a three-step approach at Connections of Mind. It's called connect, collaborate, support. Connect is about connecting the prefrontal cortex and making sure we've got a whole brain that we're working with and not just a dysregulated brain, which we're not going to get very far with. And then um, we've got collaborate, which is about working together with young people alongside them. And then uh, support is about supporting them over the 60 iterations that it takes to develop a new habit. But um, I wish I could go more into that now, but we don't have enough time. So further reading, I is going to pop um, a link to our reading and resources page on our website where you can get access to all of these books um, through Amazon if you prefer to buy them in different bookshops, that's totally fine. And we do get a small commission for any of those books that you purchase, well then you don't pay any more for that. It's just um, uh, part of the deal that we have with Amazon. So uh, please do have a look at these books. So there's The Kindness Principle, um, Laurie DeSalto is who I talked about earlier and then Lost at School. And then executive functions in the classroom, that was the Laurie Faith approach, um, compassionate leadership for school belonging, that was Catherine Riley from UCL. Um, and then we've got Brene Brown and Dare to Lead because uh, as teachers, we're all leaders in our classrooms. It's also really important to remember that we're here to help. So we are a CIC, which is a community interest company. We're a non-profit organization and we exist to support our neurodivergent community. And all of the work that we do is about the impact that we have in helping them to live in a society where people are kind to themselves and to those around them about their executive function differences. Um, so we offer one-to-one -one coaching, which for people in the UK, you can access through Access to Work um, for adults and for young people, you can access it, it through EHCP plans. Um, we also offer CPD, Continued Professional Development and Training for schools and workplaces. And we offer group support for adults who are struggling with their executive functions too. And we also offer for schools accredited professional training. So executive function uh, coach training for schools and also something called neuroinclusive classroom practice as well. Um, in that, there are four levels of accreditation. Um, so um, starting off at level one, which is our entry level and working up to level four, which is our train the trainer as well. So before I finish up today, I'm just going to put out a poll um, to everybody. If you click on any of these um, any of these areas that, that you're interested in, it will take a note that you're interested on them, and then we will send you an email tomorrow or one of the days later in the week um, to uh, send you more information about uh, the services that we can offer. So do register your interest then, and then we'll only send you information that's relevant for you. Thank you so much for that. Whilst people are finishing that up, um, I will just finish off, if it will let me. Okay. Super. Um, it's also worth taking a look at our CIM Learning um, website. Um, so Pranel is going to put up some links to our school subscription service that we have, um, which offers um, access to resources and on-demand CPD as well um, on there. So please take a look at that too. We're also on something called Mighty Networks, as well as Facebook and LinkedIn, so and Instagram, I should say, and LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, so please do look me up there if you're interested too. And that is the end of our presentation today. So I hope that has been super helpful um, for you all. Um, please, if you have any feedback for us, do email us and let us know. And um, we're always wanting to learn and do better. Um, if you um, have any specific questions, please also do let us know as well. Um, but it's been such a pleasure to take you through um, our understanding of neurodiversity today and how we can create neuroinclusive schools where every young person feels the school was designed with them in mind. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Carolina. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Addy. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Esme. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Joanna. Super. 
Great. I'm going to finish up now and let you get on with the rest of your days. But thank you so much for joining me. And we hope to see you in a Connections of Mind event in the future. Take care. Thanks, Derry. Bye.